sifter.com.au. G'day and welcome to Drop Rate by Sifter. Drop Rate is Sifter's review podcast packed with thoughts and feelings about the newest video games, giving you insights from some of the best games writers around. My name is Chris Button, and today we're talking about 2023's most anticipated game, Starfield. Joining me to discuss Bethesda's epic sci-fi RPG is Jess Zamet from player2.net.au and Sifter's own Gianni Di Giovanni. Before we get into the discussion, though, here are the top stories featured on Walkthrough, Sifter's weekly news podcast. Hi, I'm Kyle Paletto. And I'm Fiona Bartholomew. And here are the top stories this week on Walkthrough, Sifter's weekly news podcast for Sunday, 12th of November. Sony Pictures and Nintendo team up for a live-action film adaptation of The Legend of Zelda. Valve announces the spec-bumped new Steam Deck OLED, tweaking and improving everything. Australian indie CRPG Broken Roads is delayed to 2024, a week before it was due to launch. And the Overwatch League is officially done, with Blizzard and teams announcing the end. You can get every episode of Walkthrough for free on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, or on our website sifter.com.au every Sunday. Join the Sifter community on Discord at sifter.com.au forward slash discord. Gianni, starting with you, Starfield continues Bethesda Game Studios' rich history of making large-scale, big RPGs. Tell us, what's the basic concept of the team's first new IP in 25 years? Yeah, so um, if you've played a Bethesda game in the past, this is a Bethesda game through and through. It's a large-scale, mostly open-world RPG um, where you are going through the world, um, discovering quests and items and collecting loot and all of that sort of thing. Um, So much in the vein of their previous games, um, Morrowind, all the Elder Scrolls games, um, Skyrim, of course, uh, all the Fallout games as well. Um, But it's always been a long dream uh, according to Todd Howard, to take an RPG to the stars. Um, and this is Starfield. It's the um, science fiction um, themed set in a nearish future uh, world, uh, in our own world. Um, so there's a bit of a historical uh, context, which of course plays into that instead of being completely fantasy like some of the other ones are, um, where you uh, build ships, uh, you go to planets, you fight enemies, uh, you rinse and repeat again and again and again and again um, and really explore a really sort of interesting and broad world. It's um, quite uh, fascinating to sort of just dig into the little nooks and crannies of this world and and half the fun for for me and I think for a lot of other players is uh, just stumbling across cool and interesting things, which we may discuss whether or not Starfield does this as good as some of the other previous games. That broad world and so much to do and and explore is a core part of everyone's experiences that I've seen with Starfield so far. And to that point, Jess, I know that you put in about 50 hours prior to publishing your review for for Player 2. And and I know you mentioned that really felt like it only scratched the surface of what Starfield has to offer. What, what, What did Starfield do well during your time with the game ahead of review? Yeah, so I, I mean, I think it does a lot of things well, and yeah, I, I imagine we'll talk more about whether or not it's kind of groundbreaking and you know all the things it promised to be. But um, I think it's really easy to get lost in. Um, I, you know, usually when you're thinking about reviewing a game, it's like, okay, how can I get the full experience of this game while still you know completing as much of it as I can so that I have a full kind of picture of this um, of like what the game is supposed to be. Um, but with Starfield, I found myself really not wanting to rush it, I guess, kind of letting myself get distracted. And, you know, you'd be walking around a, a town and you'd overhear a conversation from some people and that would give you a new objective, like, oh, go check out what these people have been talking about. And so I would just fully, like, abandon the quest line that I I was currently on and, and go chase that instead. And I think that it, what it does really well is that there's a lot of ways to kind of go off the 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 track that you're on and and explore what the world has to offer um and there are a lot of those little stories that kind of seem really innocuous when you start um and it's like oh you know go 
investigate what's happening at this person's house or whatever or like you know oh someone someone hasn't been seen around the the area they're supposed to be for you know a while wonder what that's about and people are just kind of musing and it actually turns into this big quest like multi-stage thing that's that's um actually really dense and yeah that for me is what starfield really kind of shines in um so much so that there are entire bits of the game like the shipbuilding um and you know outpost building and stuff which we can also talk more about um that i barely touched on in 50 hours because i was too busy being distracted by the story <laughs> that's really fascinating because i almost did exactly the opposite to what you did really? i almost <laughs> played no quests and just built outposts and spaceships and fought in battles <laughs> And that's such an interesting thing about Bethesda Game Studios titles is that they do offer such a broad palette of experiences and you don't need to engage with all of the game systems to to enjoy it or to, to still walk away feeling like you've had a full experience. You mentioned, Jess, that about the promises that have been made ahead of development and, and a lot of made of you know, what, what this game is and isn't. What, you, you said in your review, actually, that Starfield almost delivers on all of its promises. What, what does it not quite deliver on from your experience? I mean, I think it really depends what you expect from Starfield. So for me, it was kind of everything I wanted it to be. It was, you know, this this big kind of, I don't know, Mass Effect slash Fallout slash a bunch of other stuff. Um, space epic that, you know, you got to explore planets. You got to play a classic Bethesda RPG in space, as as Gianni said before. It's it's just that. Um, I think there are um, if you were particularly interested in you know the actual space travel sections, so being in your ship traveling between planets, um, that all happens quite quickly in the game. There's a lot of fast travel and a lot of kind of zap from A to B, and not a lot of just like ambling around the stars. Um, which I, I think maybe some people expected um, and was maybe sort of promised. Um, but, yeah, that that's for me kind of where it fell short. I know that there are people that will disagree and that, you know, don't didn't vibe with the characters like I did. I love them, but, you know. Um, yeah, for me it was, I guess, that kind of space, actual space travel part that, yeah, maybe fell a little bit short. Yeah, and Gianni, the, the space travel, or more specifically, the, the, the shipbuilding and spending time with your ship and that customization is something that you've clearly resonated strongly with and spent a lot of time with. Tell me more about your experience with the shipbuilding and what's drawn you to that. Well, I think to, just to go to Jess's point there, I really do agree that the space stuff isn't what I guess most people were expecting, especially when you look at something like, and the comparison has been made many, many times, but No Man's Sky, right? Which really does have that sort of seamless moving from planet surface into space. Now, Starfield is not that. It is a series of different themed rooms that you move between effectively. Um, and there's lots of loading screens. And I think that does has actually hamper some of the experience of doing that. But, but what I really did like about the, um, the use of the space combat is it actually, to me, felt something very different to what we had seen in a, a game like this before, because normally, you know, moving between rooms is not new to, <laughs> to Bethesda games. Um, but uh, what it does really fascinatingly is it it gives you this whole extra layer that has never been tackled before. And I, I was someone who played a lot of, um, of Fallout 4 um, and played a lot of the uh, the outpost building mini game effectively and and put 300 hours into that game and never finished it um and so i really liked that element and also the sort of dynamic radiant factor of going off and all of a sudden you're on a planet and a, and a ship flies in and you can go and see if there's someone you need to help or someone you need to fight and then once you've done done that you can just pick up and yoink their ship off into space um you know and that was really enjoyable every time um you know i found that to be quite a fun experience to kind of jump in and out of to do little pieces of that like you would just go and explore a planet surface or a moon surface or whatever it was um and then you know see what you can accumulate and some of the cooler ships that i found were just random ones that i found about the place and they ended up being part of the experience of doing that. And then when I started digging into the actual building mechanism, it's really intuitive and it's really nicely designed. Um, and it looks cool, actually looks really cool. And I think the best thing about this you can say for this game is that it really looks cool. And the art team have done a phenomenal job on this. It's really consistent um, uh, 
really clear vision about what they were trying to achieve. Um, and they've done a really good job of that. And building ships are really viable. There's like, you know, you, there's a lot of headroom in order to experiment and play around with things. Um, you know, for people who've played things like Armored Core, I know that's a big factor of this as well. Obviously, it doesn't have the complexity of that game. But if you want to sort of dip your toes into the water and build, you know, an X-Wing or you want to build, uh, you know, a, a, a Enterprise or whatever, you probably can um, to some extent. It'll be a slightly different modified version. But that sort of sandbox stuff I find to be really fun. And I really love seeing what people can make with that stuff when they're really creative. So for me, watching that experience has been really rewarding um, as part of it. But, you know, on the other side of that, the, the storyline stuff did, it didn't grab me to be like, you know, I kind of did a lot of it um, and kind of just moved through. Um, but the if you compare it to some of the writing, even in other um, RPGs, um, it, it, the worst disadvantage is this game came out right after Baldur's Gate, right? which has such a complexity and a depth um, to it. And um, it really doesn't. And, you know, you're supposed to have these, and even Mass Effect, right? We've talked about Mass Effect too, which has this big space opera. Again, the relationships you build with the characters are really like surface level. Like, you know, one of the companions I had, I was just like, you know, hit the button to flirt or whatever. And all of a sudden, oh yeah, we're in love. And it was like, I'm your best friend forever. And you're like, well, we've really only been like running around doing, you know, blowing up a few, but like we haven't really built much of a meaningful relationship. So, you know, I think if you come into it and, and really approach it as a sandbox, um, for me at least, that was what was the most enjoyable part and, and really like hooky too. I just kept thinking about it and I'm like, what can I go to explore? What can I do? And then those early stages before all the guides and everything has been put on the internet, you just have that fun to just go and look and, and find. And that was really cool. And on, on the story note, I've seen much like in this discussion, a lot of contrasting thoughts from people who really vibe with the story and people who could rather take it or leave it. Jess, I know you feel much the opposite in terms of the way that the characters in the story grabbed you. And I've seen, seen you chat about Sarah Morgan in particular as, <laughs> as a character that you enjoyed the company of, for, for yeah. lack of a better, a better term. <laughs> T tell me, yeah. tell me what, was it, what was it that endeared yourself to, to Starfield's story and its characters? I don't know. I maybe I'm just like not critical enough of it, but um I really like Sarah Morgan. I know that people think that she's really boring and she's like a space cop or whatever, but I I like her. I think she's I think I've known people like her. I think she I don't know, reminds me of my own partner. I don't know. She's cuz she's like so uptight and so concerned about doing the right thing by the people around her and so, you know, she has these big dreams and she's really driven. But she's also kind of wants to be vulnerable, I guess, but has these experiences in the past where she has been vulnerable or she's she's made bad decisions and it kind of hasn't worked out for her. I don't know. I <laughs> I could probably talk for a while about Sarah Morgan. I, I like her. I see how you might think she's boring, but I, I disagree. Um, I think you could probably argue that the actual cast of characters that you spend time with is quite small. Um, uh, it probably would have been nicer to have a bigger selection of characters that you could, you know, flirt with or whatever, um, or even just, you know, befriend. But I think there's still, if you look broader than just, you know, the ones that are your rom your romantic options, um, there is kind of this little like family of characters, I guess, that all kind of come from different places, but have this common goal that they're all working towards that they really believe in, which is just kind of like exploring space and understanding space and feeling like the world is this really big place that they want to understand a little bit better. Um, and again, maybe it's because I, you know, I like science and I studied a bit, a bit of science stuff at, um, at uni. And so this, this idea of like investigating and researching and, and um, finding out more is really appealing to me. Um, and I, yeah, I don't know. I just liked it. Um, where I look at the systems like the shipbuilding and, and the outpost building and stuff, and I feel like that was really overwhelming to me. I was like, that's a, that's a side note in my, my quest in space. Um, and I really appreciated that. Like, there was that depth to go really into it um, that Gianni clearly enjoyed, and I love that you enjoyed it. Um, but you can also go really simple with it. So if you don't if you don't want to, you can just, like, upgrade parts of your ship and you don't have to think about where they're placed or, you know. Just buy a new one. Yeah, just buy a new one, exactly. Um, or, you know, like, even the specific parts. It could be like, oh, my thrusters aren't good enough. I'll just, like, press upgrade and upgrade my thrusters and, you know, not worry about, um, like, balancing my ship. 
Um, and I think a lot of that comes back to like the skills and where you choose to, to put your skills and stuff. So the way I play this game, um, which may have played into like my enjoyment of the story itself is to fight as little as possible. Um, I always just pour points into persuasion and then talk my way through as much as I can. So I had this character that character that was really about having these in-depth discussions with people and like really chasing down kind of dialogue options. Um, and I liked that it let me do that and it let me kind of explore a more like narrative talky way through the game more than just like, oh, I'm going to shoot these people. Great. I've achieved my outcome. On to the next, the next place, which I know is what some people love. And I, I like, I love that it gives options, I guess. Did you like the persuasion mechanic though? I found that to be quite confusing most of the time as I was playing through, you know, you try to base it on what you think the player wants you to hear, I guess, or the, yeah, the NPC wants you to hear. But half the time I felt like I was just choosing the, the wrong answers and it didn't feel intuitive or even like, you know, in previous games where you would get a sort of an idea of a, your chance at being successful, like that felt like a more of a rewarding sort of thing. I'm curious what you think about that. Yeah, I mean, I, I didn't hate it, but I'm also aware that I probably had an easier time with it because I was more skilled in persuasion. So, like, I would be getting options, like, beyond just the persuade mechanic that would be like, oh, you can intimidate in this conversation or you can, like, you know, take other other options. And I was kind of doing it enough that my auto-persuade was refreshing fairly frequently. So if there was a conversation that I really, really, really wanted to succeed at, I could auto persuade and it would just kind of let me through. Um, I do agree that there are some times when I would choose dialogue options and be really sure of what I was choosing, that it was, that it was going to work and it wouldn't. And I was like, okay, well, it's kind of disappointing because a character would have said like the sentence before words essentially to, to the effect of what I would then repeat back to them. Um, so yeah, I, I can see the frustration with it. It, it wasn't, you know, amazing. I didn't hate it. It was, it worked for me most of the time. Like it achieved my goals, so it was kind of fine for me. Gianni, what to you about Starfield's sort of quests and writing felt a little bit surface level to you? There were a few like really bright moments in it that I really liked, but I look at something like Horizon series, Horizon Zero Dawn and Forbidden West, and how every little side area that you come to, the characters feel really 3D. They feel dynamic. They feel really, you know, great. They, they're beautifully acted and all of these things. And I just felt like, you know, it, it, the the storyline to me and the quests that were in there really felt like jumping from quest giver to quest giver in an MMO. Like I didn't feel like I spent enough time with them. Um, you know, it was kind of like, oh, what's, you know, go get 15 boar pelts or whatever it was, of like space boar pelts or, you know, whatever it is. Like some of that just kind of felt very surface level. I also found it really surprising that a game that has come out in 2023 kind of didn't really seem to do huge amounts with the idea that of like space colonialism as well. Um, I found it to be like, oh, whatever, just like, and there's that it kind of that U US manifest destiny, we must go across the continent and claim everything that's ours as well, um, which I found to be like, maybe plays that really nicely to an American audience. But, you know, I think in the context of here, we have in Australia where we're having conversations about the consequences of, of boundless expansion and, and what is left this is a, a universe that doesn't have other people uh, other than the humans that are there. So, um, you know, that does change the the consequences a bit, but the fact that everyone's just kind of blasting off around the universe and setting up all stuff around, like, it didn't seem to meaningfully engage with that in a really interesting way that I think that if it was like a obsidian game, they totally would have, you know, the gray and the complexity didn't seem to be there. There was a real push to be, <laughs> effectively a space cop, a lot. While you're running with the Crimson Fleet, you're undoubtedly going to be faced with some morally gray decisions. It's going to be difficult for you to weigh the consequences of pulling the trigger while maintaining your cover. Do what you have to do, but remember why you're out there in the first place. Once you bluff your way into the Crimson Fleet, then the operation proceeds to evidence gathering. If I didn't have confidence in your abilities, we wouldn't be having this conversation. Remember, 
This entire operation rests on your ability to infiltrate the Crimson Fleet and bring us the evidence we need to take them down. Um, which I found to be really strange um, to do as well. Like, uh, you know, some of this stuff I was like, eh, whatever. So I kind of just mostly opted out of it and had a really enjoyable time just going around and exploring bits and pieces. But the main storylines, you know, being part of the UC Vanguard or um, even became part of the, the Freestyle Alliance, I think it's called. Um, you know, I didn't want to be a space cowboy or a space cop. So, you know, they weren't like, I didn't mind doing the constellation quest, which just, as you mentioned, it's like, you know, the, the joy of exploration. Um, but then there was also that bit about going to collect an artifact as well. It's like going and just piling up artifacts for the sake of science. And I'm like, and then if you go into their, like their office, right, their like lodge that they have on the planet of New Atlantis, it's kind of filled with all these amazing explorers. But, you know, some of those explorers aren't great. I'm pretty sure there's a Captain Cook picture at one of them, you know, on the wall. So, you know, part of that thing is like the boundless exploration. Um, you know, it didn't seem to intellectually, you know, acknowledge any of that. Maybe I'm wrong. I'm sure models will come in and fix it as well. But from what I saw, I thought it was really, you know, let's go and pick up whatever from space. And, you know, Fallout, I think, is a series which I think, you know, ponders the nature of war and power and, and, um, and you know, these growing and escalating and destructive abilities that people have. And yes, it's done in a kind of cartoony sort of way. And yes, the earlier games do it in a better way. But really at the core of it, it's about thinking about the, the, the damage that conflict causes to humanity and, and you trying to eke out a, of an existence as part of that but that's the core of what that series is and I, I didn't get the same thing from starfield so i spent time building spaceships like to me it must have been a conscious choice to avoid engaging with that topic of like space colonialism because there is no one but people that have kind of left earth to then you like know, a space colony. Build it. Yeah. Like there's a noticeable lack of aliens, which um, like gen generally in the world, there's, you know, there's plot points, whatever. But like there's a, a, a lack of aliens compared to something like Mass Effect where they kind of engage with that and the different races. And, you know, um, yeah, I I wonder if it's an attempt to kind of just brush over it and push it to the side and, oh, we won't, we won't worry about that. We won't think about the big problems. We'll just... Yeah, collecting stuff in space. Like, it feels like a meaningful choice to not engage with it, which is, you know, maybe not great. Yeah, I mean, choosing not to engage with something is a choice in and of itself. Yes. And I think it taps into Bethesda Game Studios' history of making games that feel a mile wide and an inch deep, to use a oft-used uh, sort of analogy there. And... I think both of your experiences truly reflect that in terms of Jess, your your strong engagement with the story, the quest lines, and and seeing that through. And Gianni, your your experience in terms of just engaging with the, the spacefaring aspect, in particular the, the shipbuilding and and so on and so forth. And I feel like Starfield does try to be a game for everyone, and in doing so, perhaps perhaps alienate some people who are looking for complexity and depth in one area and, and not the other. But Gianni, you started out your discussion by saying this is through and through a Bethesda game, a Bethesda RPG, and this this sci-fi coat of paint and revised systems and gameplay mechanics and different setting doesn't really change that fact, nor, nor should I think they should really hide that fact because... Bethesda RPGs are very popular for a reason. They're, they're big. They allow people to create their own fun, act as a, as a sandbox for people to tell their own stories and engage with the game however they so wish and role play however they wish as well. I, I wonder as well, actually, potentially, because think of the other settings that they um, make games in, in a completely fantasy world or even like a really fully pulpy sci-fi sort of um, world as well. You may be better able to... Um, explore some of this stuff without running the risk of, you know, causing the ire of, it's a big mass market game. It's had, a, you know, millions and millions and millions of dollars of budgeting done to it. You know, it's this tentpole release for, for the Xbox and the Game Pass and all of these things as well. But it's fundamentally still set in a world that's a future Earth that we live in currently, which means, you know, that maybe that doesn't give them the room or the scope with which to explore certain things. It's, you know, maybe a disadvantage. Yeah, I, I can't 
you know, I, I don't want to assume the developer's intent, but from the outside looking in, it very much does look like an RPG aimed at sort of the, the widest possible market. And I don't mean that as a, a derogatory uh, sort of observation, um, just, just one that even with Baldur's Gate 3, and it's very difficult not to make the comparison considering it's such a big RPG that's released almost alongside day and date with uh, or it nearly did release day and date with with starfield but it's that's drawn quite a popular audience and a lot of people have drawn to it because of its its complexity and depth of mechanics and and storytelling and, and that sort of thing but again starfield i think has has a broader appeal and i i question despite all of the, the time and development, all of the money that's been thrown at it and that the context within it exists in terms of being this tentpole release at the centre of Microsoft's very recent and very aggressive acquisition strategy. I, it, was, it was better put than me by Patricia Hernandez for Pace Magazine who, who wrote that Starfield is too big to fail and that despite a lot of its systems perhaps having been done better and before elsewhere very few games combine all these together and it does feel like a bit of a microcosm of AAA game development in terms of trying to be everything to everyone you know as many people as possible so Jess what, what do you make of all this in terms of does Starfield really push the, the RPG genre forward and does it even matter um I, look I think the answer is no to both of your questions. I I don't think it does push the RPG genre forward. Like, it, you know, Johnny said a bunch of times, and I totally agree, it's a Bethesda RPG. Like, it's just Fallout in space. But I don't think that it necessarily has to be more than Fallout in space. Um, I'm kind of okay with it just being that. And, you know, we we see that this, this year particularly, um, there have been games that have combined and pushed genres, like Tears of the Kingdom coming out earlier in the year. Like, it took a, a formula of Zelda games and then added this whole extra element of, you know, building and customization that we weren't used to. So I don't know if maybe the the new expectation is that these big games have to do something new and do something big. Um, and I don't necessarily think that they do have to. I mean, I think you could argue that Starfield does in some ways because it, you know, adds that ship customization and that, that outpost management and, um, you know, those are kind of new ish things for a Bethesda game um and yeah I I think that that's okay I think that Bethesda made a lot of big promises with um Starfield and so they had to deliver something that was big and if they hadn't they would have been in in trouble um but I don't believe that it has to be groundbreaking to be big and expansive I guess I honestly think that, to be honest, a game of this scale, it's tricky for it to be groundbreaking because mm. of so many competing priorities, um, commercial impl implications and all of that sort of stuff. You know, as you said, Chris, it's got to meet as many people as possible. And I, I want to be very clear, it's like a really fun game. It's a great world yeah. to explore. Um, I really like jumping in and out of it um, in nice little chunks. It suits that sort of gameplay really well, um, you know, but... I'm really excited for when the modders get involved and start making some really cool stuff because they have done and they've always done this with the Bethesda games and they build it and support that uh, so that it can be built upon. And that's really great. In the whole jumping in, jumping out style of gameplay that I, I really agree that Bethesda RPGs suit that type of gameplay really, really well. I, I, I want to share briefly my experience with Skyrim when, when that released it was initially meant to release on the 11th of the 11th, 2011, but I know here in Australia it broke straight date. So I got it on the 10th of November, uh, which which felt scandalous at the time. And I played a chunk of it at the time, put it down. I think there were some bugs at the time. And I didn't actually finish the main quest, the main campaign, until I picked it up on Nintendo Switch about 10 years later. And I anticipate my experience with Starfield will probably very be very similar. I'm enjoying my time dipping in and engaging with it on a fairly surface level in comparison to the way I normally play games. But there, there's, I think that the numbers are there in terms of the amount of people who have played Starfield already. I think it had hit over 6 million players by launch or shortly after launch 
and to to that point, I think that that proves that there is space, if you can excuse the the lack of a better word, <laughs> for for this game to to exist and these types of games to exist. And I think it'll be really really interesting to to follow Starfield over a longer period of time to to gauge its its impact on the video game industry culturally and and just the the, the way that people play this game for for years to come which will be really really interesting i i have to to ask before we finish up gianni you you left me with the the cryptic note before we recorded you really want to talk about doors gianni please take the floor um the art and design i've talked about a little bit in this game the artistic vision of this game and is uh whoever was doing art direction on this is like needs a prize seriously it looks incredible everything pieces together in a really beautiful way the characters look the best that they have ever done but you know what god those doors are good every door is awesome it opens in such a really fascinating way and every time i'm going through a new area and i see something i'm like oh i haven't seen this door before how's it going to open up and it's just incredible and i know doors are like actually one of the most complex things to build in a video game so the fact that they've probably done some really next gen this is the thing where Starfield's pushed the envelope. The doors are the best I've ever seen in a video game. I cannot get enough of them. And, you know, maybe I'll write a full essay about why I think the doors are incredible. Um, but, yeah, I think that's just one part of the, the thing. If you look at the way that it's, um, you know, that these uh, you interact with the world, um, it looks cool. It just, it just looks like it's a cool game. And it feels like a real world that you're in, even if the people, to me, feel a bit like cardboard cutouts that are kind of sitting there or animatronics. Um, the, the space in which you play in... Um, is incredible and i think if you look at all the art and design for all the rest of it it you know it, it's done a really cool job of making it look like a real spacey game so yeah check out the doors and, and tell yeah, them when, i sent you <laughs> when you're in a bit you know like an airlock style situation and you interact with the door in front of you and you can just h- kind of hear the one behind you closing oh so good the best the the word sandbox I feel is one that we've perhaps worn out its welcome throughout this discussion, but it, it's such a, a great descriptor of Starfield in terms of that there's so much for for you to engage with Jess. I know you you really really dug the story and the quest lines and the characters, and and that's something that a lot of people will resonate with. Whereas there'll be plenty of people like Gianni as well who who just don't you know don't engage with that for one reason or another and totally lose hours to building ships and admiring the scenery and specifically the the doors of starfield's architecture (laughs) so with with that all in mind jess do you rate or drop starfield i rate starfield i i think it's exactly what i wanted it to be it's you know and maybe the story is surface level but I, i was you know happy with that it was surface level but big enough um yeah, I, I happily rate Starfield. Gianni, same to you. Do you drop or rate Starfield? I rate it, but I think I will be remembering different things to what other people will be remembering, and I think that's good, honestly, um, that it's got a broad enough appeal that um, you your memories of, of playing this will be completely different to someone else, and, and that's a really valuable space to play in. And I'm really excited um, for the potential of what modders can do with this game. And um, they're already starting to do some really cool stuff, bringing across stuff from previous games as well. Um, and I think once you get into that, the, the, the best experience we'll be playing in about six months to a year um, when it's uh, available um, with a full complement of mods. So definitely one to check out. And especially it's on the Game Pass as well. So the barrier of entry is really low, which I think is a really important um, factor to consider. It's not like you have to um, go and um, spend a big amount of money to to experience a bit of this and see how you go. And that is Starfield by Bethesda Game Studios. I guarantee that we'll be talking about this game for a long time to come. Sit down for a chat with your pals in video games. You're listening to Sifter. This has been Drop Rate by Sifter, our video game review podcast. Thanks to Brian Fairbanks from Salty Dog Sounds for composing the theme music. And Sifter is produced by Chris Button, Fiona Bartholomeus, Daniel Ang, and Adam Christou. Mitch Lowe is senior producer, and Gianni Di Giovanni is our executive producer. Jess, 
where can we find you to read and follow more of your work? Uh, most of my gaming review stuff goes up on player2.net.au, so you can check out the site um, or follow me on Twitter, X, whatever it is. Um, now I am at Zamet Jess. And Gianni, it almost feels a little bit redundant to be asking this of you who runs Sifter, uh, working working at the coalface. Where can people find you to, to see a lot of your work? Well, what I would ask you to do is please follow us on anything other than X, any other platform at all, please. Sure. <laughs> um, find us on um, Sifter HQ, on Blue Sky, on Mastodon, um, on Threads, anywhere else you find us. We've also got a newsletter as well that I'd love for you to jump on board to check out um, if your social uh, account burden has become too too much to deal with currently. Um, and you can get that at sifter.com.au forward slash newsletter. I would like to be clear. Uh, you should also follow me on things that aren't aren't that. It's just that that's the easiest hub to find all of my other other things. So if you go there, you'll find me in all the better places. Indeed, you can find Sifter among the fragmented social media landscape, as as Gianni said, at Sifter HQ on most platforms. There's Discord. There's there's Sifter.com.au for written content as well. And if you enjoyed this episode of Drop Rate, please consider leaving a review on Apple Podcasts or any other platform and sharing the episode on social media. This helps put us in front of more people and enables us to provide more in-depth coverage. Plus, you can check out our other podcast, Lightmap, where we talk to game developers, creatives, and people who are doing cool things in interactive media on your favourite podcast app of choice. Thanks for joining us. See you next time. Hey there, Gianni here on the latest episode of Lightmap Sifter's interview podcast. Abby Howard and Tony Howard Arias join us to share Slay the Princess, a spooky visual novel that really gets you to question what you're actually doing. You wake up on a path in the woods and a mysterious voice in your head tells you that if you do not go to a cap and slay a princess, she is going to end the world. And what you do with that information from there is entirely up to you. You poor thing. Your hands are shaking. Are you scared of me? Because you should be. So one of our challenges has been consistently writing scenarios where there are extremely difficult outcomes, but then there is nothing that can lead to premature player death. So you make a decision, you live with the consequences, you move on. You can get every episode of Lightmap for free on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, on sifter.com.au or wherever you like to listen. <laughs>